Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Lou Lopes. I uh, have the distinguished honor of being serving as the fourth superintendent at Southeastern Regional. Uh, we do have a, a pretty full agenda and a lot of uh, distinguished guests with us today, so uh, I want to try to respect everyone's schedule, and my job is to kind of keep it moving so we can finish on time. Um, I want to begin just kind of by acknowledging uh, several of the people who, who helped put this all together, um, our sponsor schools that helped, helped Southeastern. Uh, this truly was a kind of a group effort uh, to put this together in a very short time. Blue Hills, Bristol Plymouth, Cape Cod Tech, South Shore, Southeast and Ant, Tri-County and Upper Cape. So thank you very much for your help and assistance. Thank you. <laughs> Between the seven school districts mentioned, we provide quality vocation education to students in over 61 communities. I also want to recognize all the volunteer school committee members who serve on these and other boards. Would any school committee members present please stand and be recognized? Thank you. There's also uh, two classes joining us today, uh, Dr. Clifton's, and this is, by the way, this is the first day of next year's schedule. So they're meeting, so they're meeting the students are meeting their teachers for the first time, um, but, uh, and, they, and they decided to bring them here. Uh, Dr. Clifton teaches advanced placement government here at Southeastern, and he has his class uh, here with him today, so thank you. Thank you, students. And Mrs. Brown's video production students uh, are also here, so thank you. And <laughs> Finally, I want to thank members of AVTE, MAVA, and the Southeastern staff, especially my assistant, Deb Cabral, uh, who really helped with all the details. So thank you, Deb, and everyone else. <laughs> the Alliance of Vocational Technical Education is a relatively new partnership of varied member organizations that recognize the worth of career and vocational te technical education in Massachusetts. The Alliance believes that every child should have access to high quality CVTE programs, facilities and equipment. Their main goal is to increase access to high quality vocational education. There are three co-chairs of this group. They include Lou Finfer, the Executive Director of Massachusetts Community Action Network. I know Lou's here, saw him earlier. Um, Dave Ferrer, Executive Director, of the Massachusetts Association of Vocational Administrators, and Tim Murray, President and CEO of the Worcester Regional Chamber of Commerce and our first speaker. Tim was born and raised in Worcester, earned his bachelor's degree at Fordham University and his law degree from Western New England School College School of Law in 1997. He was elected to serve on the Worcester City Council. In 2001, he was elected mayor of Worcester, a position he held up until 2007 when he was inaugurated as the 71st Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts. Currently, he holds the position of President and CEO of the Worcester Regional Chamber of Commerce. Tim has always been a champion for vocational education. He not only visited every single vocational school, both comprehensive and regional, while he was Lieutenant Governor, he helped establish a fund to modernize vocational equipment throughout the Commonwealth. It is my honor to introduce Tim Murray. Thanks, Lou, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, what a great turnout, and really appreciate the effort that all the schools and the leadership, uh, but, but with Lou at the point and bringing us uh, here together. And for those AP students, uh, AP government students are here, I mean, you hit the trifecta. We've got not uh, only local government, where I like to say uh, the rubber meets the road. We've got some of our state officials. I saw Representative Cronin uh, uh, right there. Uh, and then we've got our Congressman uh, Joe Kennedy, and I, I think that speaks to the commitment and the growing belief and understanding of how important vocational technical uh, schools and educations uh, are to our communities and to the business community. Uh, as, as Lou mentioned, about uh, two years ago, uh, MAVA, the Mass Association of Vocational School Administrators, Dave Ferreira, and, and I, uh, in my capacity as President and CEO of the Worcester Regional Chamber of Commerce, we hosted a statewide summit in Worcester on Voc Tech education to how to bring together policymakers, people who are doing it every day, and, 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 and you know at our schools, the educators, to bring bring together the employment community to talk about setting uh, an agenda for Voc Tech education. 
Uh, and uh, sh shortly, and it was a great event. Speaker DeLeo came and, and talked about uh, his ongoing commitment to Vogue Tech Education and some of the things that he wanted to see happen. But we said we, we need to kind of keep this going. And at the same time, Lou Finfer from the Mass Community Action Network was, com was specifically looking at the waiting lists in some of our gateway cities uh, where, where students, just because of the demand, uh, did not have access. So we decided to form the Alliance for Vocational Technical Education, bringing together this broad uh, array of stakeholders who understand the importance of voc tech education in terms of giving young people meaningful, purposeful career paths, uh, and also understanding how important it is to the employment community. And Barry Bluestone's gonna talk about that. I mean, and we, so we came together uh, as the Alliance and we've raised uh, some money uh, to fund not only Barry study, but to do uh, some other things that we feel are important in getting the word out. Uh, and Barry's report is very important. I think you'll find it, it, it compelling because it takes what we all kind of hear anecdotally and it validates it. Uh, and it's with that information, we've been able to go to the, to the legislature, to the administration, and we're fighting hard to secure, to make sure that the $75 million in the Economic Development Bill stays. There's a planning grant uh, that is all about business community, high, uh, business community, the educational community, and the employer community uh, coming together to try to expand access. So we're really pleased uh, about the momentum that we've been able to develop in a short period of time with such a, a, a great coalition. Uh, and uh, we know that there's more uh, ahead for us. Uh, and let me just say, uh, going back, how great it is to have Congressman Kennedy here. You know, uh, like me, he's a recovering lawyer. Um, <laughs> But, uh, uh, but uh, unlike uh, me, uh, uh, unlike, uh, he, he's unique in the sense that uh, under, underneath that recovering lawyer piece uh, is an engineer, Stanford engineer, who, uh, and with that, I think, becomes a, 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 there's a very unique understanding and appreciation for what vocational technical education is all about and what it means for our future economy, for our innovation economy here in Massachusetts. So it's really great to have the congressman uh, here with us to, to give that voice not only here, but in Washington on all of your behalf. So, thanks, Lou. Thanks, Tim. I think last time you were here, we uh, made you ride the Segway. <laughs> so, uh, I also want to recognize Jack McCarthy's here, the executive director of MSBA, uh, MSBA and he uh, uh, largely responsible. This, uh, this We just went through about three or four years ago, a $34 million renovation project funded 80% um, by the MSBA, and we did, we did those renovations without any increase in assessment, any debt exclusions or overrides in any of our nine member communities. So Jack, thank you for all your assistance. <laughs> Soon after Joe Kennedy was elected as a U.S. Representative of Commonwealth's fourth congressional district, he reached out to Southeastern and other schools and asked if he could come visit. He wanted to learn what we did and why vocation, vocational schools were so successful. I was warned by his assistants that he only had 45 minutes and could we arrange for him to talk to some students and teachers. Two and a half la hours later, Congressman Kennedy was still roaming the halls, having fun with the engineering students, and he even stayed for lunch with, with our culinary arts students. He quickly became a powerful national advocate for vocational education. As a congressman, he has been a leading voice on STEM education in Washington and Massachusetts. He has worked with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support legislation that helps promote economic growth and transformation in Massachusetts. In August 2013, he introduced the Revitalized American Manufacturing and Innovation Act with Representative Tom Reed of New York. A bipartisan bill, Ramey brings together partners from industry and academia to support small and mid-sized manufacturers in research, development, and workforce training. The bill was passed by the full House and Senate and signed into law by President Obama in December 2014. Joining us today to provide a national perspective, Congressman Joe Kennedy III. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, extraordinarily kind introduction. It's wonderful to be back uh, here at Southeastern. I have to say, I think the last time I was here, um, they were demoing that segue right here. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you were brave enough to write it, Governor. Um, they didn't let me write it, I don't think. Um, but it was pretty impressive. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to, to come back, as always, and join you. Um, to Dave, um, 
thank you for everything you do, uh, being a leading voice here in Massachusetts and nationally, as we try to take the lessons that we learn here uh, down in Washington, D.C. Um, the Lieutenant Governor was extraordinarily generous and gracious with his comments. Um, recovering lawyer, um, recovering engineer, I'm kind of crossing off careers as I go, some would say, in the wrong direction. Nevertheless, um, it, um, I have been uh, engaged and tried to engage on issues of career and technical uh, education, uh, our extraordinary vocational schools, and uh, access to opportunity since uh, certainly I came into office and a little bit beforehand. There has been no uh, stronger, clearer voice on these issues than uh, Governor, Lieutenant Governor Murray. Um, the statewide Governor's STEM Council that I sit on was initially Lieutenant Governor's uh, statewide STEM Council, um, and he was gracious enough to uh, get me involved in it. Um, the fact that he continues to champion these issues in his current perch, I think, is a testament to not only the vision that he has as Massachusetts, for Massachusetts as being a leader in ensuring that everybody has access to the jobs of the future, but ties right into uh, one of the extraordinary success stories we've seen in Massachusetts, which is the revitalization and extraordinary growth of Worcester. Um, so, Governor, really, thank you very, very much for everything. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you for being here. Um, Arlette, look forward to hearing from you as well. Thank you for um, bringing a valuable insight to this discussion from the perspective of the students. Um, I don't know if the mayor is here yet. Um, oh. Mayor, how are you? Good to see you. Excuse me, I didn't see you on the way in. Um, thank you for um, having me. Um, thank you for what you do, and Representative Cronin as well, um, for your leadership here in Massachusetts on, uh, on these issues. To everybody here this morning, I'm so grateful for your friendship, your engagement that you've shown me and my office from my very first days in office. Partnering with our Commonwealth's Vote Tech Schools has been one of the absolute highlights of my first two terms in office. Over the past few years, I've been fortunate enough to run around not just the 4th District, but the, the state, uh, looking at our career and technical education programs. And I've seen students design and build everything from segways to a 130-pound model of an M1A1 tank to a crosswalk system for an impoverished African village. I've watched wind turbines go up in a Newton North Innovation Lab We've seen the team at Bristol Aggie work to save species of rare, endangered turtles, and met Tri-County students hard at work at EMC, one of the leading big data companies in the world. There's no doubt in my mind that your students are going to be on the very front lines of our modern economy. And that's all due to what you have shown them and taught them and led the way, and how you've led the way. Now, besides make me feel like I was uh, pretty big slacker in high school. <laughs> my experience with vocational education students here in Massachusetts has helped shape my priorities in Washington. You all have encouraged my mission as an IRA co-chair of the Governor's STEM Council. We're working hard to see STEM not just as a vehicle for innovation and growth, but as an opportunity for, as a, uh, a vehicle for access and opportunity. You've influenced my approach to workforce development and local economic growth where my office has worked with stakeholders from across the Commonwealth to support our middle skill workforce. You've inspired the legislative action we've taken in Washington. And as many of you know, we introduced a bill called the Perkins Modernization Act a couple of years ago. It's a bipartisan bill that would update the Carl D. Perkins Career and, education, uh, Career and Technical Education Act and ask states and local school districts to use labor market data from their region to inform their curriculum. By tailoring classes and training to the needs of local businesses, it would ensure that the uh, students that are prepared to enter the workforce in their own backyard, and employers don't have to look further than their own community for future employees. Creating jobs, training a workforce uh, to fill them, and creating businesses uh, with local schools aren't red issues or blue issues. And we're hoping to uh, keep the growing support as we try to build the, uh, build the bill going forward. We also introduced the STEM Gateways Act to expand access to STEM education for women, minorities, and low-income families. After a long, <laughs> unfortunately, tough fight, um, we got much of the language actually included in a federal update to No Child Left Behind that was signed by the President last year. And you know what made that possible? Seriously? It was the stories that those of us who do believe in this system 
that we've learned from all of you were able to take to the debate in Washington. Stories that helped me convince colleagues on both sides of the aisle that this bill and this cause will help strengthen our economy and increase opportunity for students all across our country. I don't think I have to tell any of you how hard it can be to find some bipartisan support in Washington these days. But the fact that it exists around this issue, around the students that you teach and mentor, around the vision that you hold, is a testament to the power of what you do. If you look at the big challenges facing our country today, how to improve access to our education system and reverse a growing opportunity gap, how to address a shortage of skilled workers American companies need to grow and thrive, how to restore a once robust middle class that has long defined this country, how to keep the United States at the cutting edge of a global economy. I challenge you to find a place where career and technical education does not play an integral role. I am honored to be your friend, your partner, and your champion wherever and however I can be. Please let me, let my office know how we can continue to be your partner and your advocate in Washington in the days and years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. When Mayor Carpenter took office as part of his inaugural speech, he challenged the citizens of Brockton to work together in order to create jobs and to provide a quality public and school education. In fact, Mayor Carpenter, the City Council, and the Brockton School Department have always been very supportive and partners at Southeastern. He has not missed one of our graduations and is a frequent visitor to our school. Here today to offer a welcome on behalf of the City of Brockton, Mayor Bill Carpenter. Well, Lou, <clears throat> Lou forgot to mention that most of my visits revolve around lunch hour to check out the <laughs> Culinary Arts Program. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to uh, join Representative Cronin in welcoming everyone here. It was great to have the Congressman here. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the graduations, Lou, because we can stand here all day long and intellectually talk about the skills gap in cities like Brockton, what mid-level job skill training means to families in a place like Brockton, how we create opportunities for first-generation uh, college students by coming to a technical school like here and developing job skills and the education to go on to college. Um, but if you really want to get it, come to a graduation, uh, because I do come here, and uh, you know, nearly two-thirds of the students here at this school are from Brockton. So this is a Brockton school in many ways, although we don't get to have any say in how you spend all our money, <laughs> but that's a whole other topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but we believe in the mission, and uh, come to a graduation and see the families of the graduates and what it means to those families to see their next generation graduating from here with a career already in hand before they go on to continue their education. And we, the superintendent and I, you know, worrying about educational funding for cities like Brockton. Uh, but I think unfortunately what happens, and I'm glad this is a regional thing, you know, the urban cities and the suburbs and the Votex and the urban school districts, it's like we're all competing for the same educational dollars. And I think what I'm very excited about is in a few moments, you're going to hear from the, super, the two superintendents talking about us um, trying to collaborate. And instead of maybe fighting for the resources, we ought to start doing a better job of figuring out how to pool the resources for the benefits of the young people growing up in our city. So I'm truly excited about that, and I thank both superintendents for their willingness to work. Uh, Representative Cronin is a huge advocate for the city of Brockton and the town of Easton uh, at the State House, and Representative, we thank you, thank you for everything you do for us. And, uh, and I have to just, a quick shout out to Lieutenant Governor Murray, 
who is one of the best friends the city of Brockton ever had during his uh, term as Lieutenant Governor. So, Lieutenant Governor, it's great to see you back in the region. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mayor. One of AVTE's core missions is to work with all levels of government in order to promote CVTE as a powerful educational resource and the indispensable foundation for future prosperity in the Commonwealth. State Representative Claire Cronin represents the 11th Plymouth District, which includes parts of Brockton and the town of Easton. I first met Representative Cronin during a four-way Democratic primary debate held here at Southeastern. During that debate, she talked about the importance of economic development, career and technical education, and education in general. Representative Cronin graduated from Brockton High School, attended Stonehill College in Easton, and earned a Juris Doctorate degree from Suffolk University. She has stayed true to her word and serves on the Manufacturing Caucus. Here today to introduce and offer a welcome on behalf of all the state legislators, Representative Claire Cronin. Good morning and thank you. It's terrific to be here uh, with some of my Brockton colleagues and members of the legislature. Um, one of the things that we support very strongly within the legislature is our vocational schools. We know that for Massachusetts to be competitive, we must support the voc ed schools so that we can provide the skills to create the jobs that will further improve our economy. So in doing that, we have various things within the legislature. One is people always hear about our committees, but not they don't often hear about some of the caucuses we have. We do have a manufacturing caucus, of which I am a member. And this is very, very important because beyond the re regular <coughs> legislative duties we have, we're always brainstorming and looking for ideas to advance our economy. And one of the key things that we always focus on is our vocational education. And it's important and it's a priority for all of us. We can't do it alone. Within the legislature, we have a very, very strong group that supports this. Today, I am here with some of my colleagues. I also have to give a shout out beyond uh, Brockton Mayor Carpenter. We have some of our local city councilors in Brockton. Uh, Councilor Shirley Azak is here. Councilor Jack Lally is here. Councilor Ann Beauregard, our school superintendent. Mark Lindy, Southeastern Regional School Committee member. All of these people have a very, very strong commitment to this school and to vocational education in general. Within the House, I am joined here today by Jess Aptowitz, who is representing Senator Jim Timulty. I'm represented by Hannah Switlikowski from Representative Lou Kafka's office from Stoughton and Sharon. And we are all happy to support the cause here, uh, support you, support our students. So on behalf of the legislature, I welcome you all to this terrific school, this great town as well. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Steve Darkery. I'm the superintendent at Tri-County Regional Vocational School, and I'm going to be introducing our next speaker to give us a regional employment perspective. When Lou was um, reaching out to many of the superintendents that are here today, he was asking for somebody who could provide that regional employment perspective. And I couldn't think of any but anyone better than our next speaker. Bob Vozella is a graduate of Tri-County, has a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from Wentworth Institute of Technology. Bob is the Manufacturing Manager at TE Connectivity in Norwood, Mass. He's the former Chairman and presently a member of our Engineering Technology Program Advisory Committee. Bob's company has employed two engineering technology students from Tri-County each of the last three years through our cooperative education program, including his own daughter this year. Bob has donated his time and his company's resources over the last few years as we, as we have added an advanced manufacturing component to our engineering technology program. Bob was instrumental in helping us to become a satellite campus of Wentworth Institute of Technology. We now offer machine tooling courses, including CNC, four nights a week to adult learners at Tri-County. 
Bob is also the parent of two students at Tri-County. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Bob Vozella. Good morning, and thank you very much for having me here. It's, a, it's, it's very much a pleasure. Um, I am the manufacturing manager at TE Connectivity in Norwood, Mass., where we employ over 200 people in the manufacturing sector. I manage a world-class machining operation. TE works very closely with Tri-County as we employ several of their engineering students as co-ops, and it has proven very beneficial for our company. TE is also a strong supporter of the STEM and FIRST, and first Robotics programs. Several of our employees are volunteers and, uh, and whenever possible. I enjoy working closely with TE as an uh, advisory board member to support their engineering program. I, as Steve had mentioned, I'm also a graduate of uh, Tri-County and Wentworth Institute of Technology. I have been teaching in the manufacturing and machining sector for the past 17 years at the both continuing education and postgraduate level. This puts me at first hand to see what the Commonwealth needs to help fulfill jobs in the demand of skilled labor. Hiring of high skills is always preferred, but difficult to find. We think of capital, we think of equipment as capital, capital, but it's our human capital that we need to invest in. Basic hands-on technical training, coupled with classroom work on soft skills, are what many companies are looking for. For example, lean manufacturing, basic math, blueprint reading, best work practices, and of course, professional behaviors. A candidate that has spent six or more months developing these skills is someone that would be in high demand with local manufacturing companies. To demonstrate this approach, TE has hired over 15 employees from the Wentworth program. A well-trained workforce offers a competitive advantage, allowing to drive innovation, customer satisfaction, quality, development, and growth. The beneficial byproduct is engaged, loyal employees satisfied stakeholders, and a thriving economy. These successes and the needs of the community was the inspiration to reestablish the Manufacturing Center of Excellence at Tri-County Regional. In early December, Tri-County was award, in early December of 2014, Tri-County was awarded a state grant. We fitted the, uh, the shop with two machines. It was in January of that year that that shop was filled with 15 students from the partnership developed with Wentworth. We continue to teach classes there at Tri-County and hiring the students from the program. Not long after, we received another grant and we uh, equipped the shop with two more machines. As of recent, two more machines along with advanced manufacturing equipment will be fitted with Tri-County. It is now one of the hubs of our hiring uh, resources. These students and folks in the back that I see, students here at, at this uh, school, is the future in the world that we live in. By investing in their education and classes and hands-on hands -on experience, these students are able to have successful careers and provide valuable work experience to companies like TE Connectivity. The state of Massachusetts and districts like this are in need to promote these programs and continue to bring a bright shining uh, for, for everybody's future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, that was great. I met Arlette DeVille in the start of her sophomore year. She wanted me to interview her, and, and she was seeking a recommendation as a SkillsUSA officer candidate. Even as a sophomore, I was amazed by her poise, the passion, and drive that this young lady possessed. Her story is amazing. And talk about busy. I had to arrange a ride for her today at Stonehill. She's been at Girl State all week, finishing up today, and then she flies out to Louisville, Kentucky this weekend to join Team Massachusetts in this year's SkillsUSA competition. Here to tell her story, Ms. Arlette DeVille. Good morning, everyone. My name is Arlette DeVille, and I am enrolled in the Medical Assisting Program here at Southeastern Regional Vocational Technical High School, and I am also from Rockton. 
I would like to start by stating how much of an honor it is for me to be speaking in front of you today. My journey began in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, where I was born. I lived in a two-parent household with my sister, who served as a second guide to me. My mother was a lawyer, and my father was an accountant. They both worked their hardest to provide for my sister and I. I attended a very rigorous Catholic school where I was obligated to study assigned pages of several books and recite them the next morning, as well as turning in assigned homeworks. The nuns and teachers inspected our uniforms daily to make sure that they were clean with no rips and not short. We were severely spoken to for slouching our backs, dragging our feet, and even simple things like biting our nails. Needless to say, that we had to portray the best example that we could as students of a Catholic school. At the time, those rules seemed senseless. But as I get older, I realize that there are rules that I need in order to succeed as a young lady. Some of you might remember the tragic effect of the massive earthquake that happened in Port-au-Prince, Haiti on January 12, 2010. There were many loved ones lost and casualties. Though, I am glad to say that my family and I physically survived it. Yet, how can anyone survive such disaster? We might have been alive, but mentally, we weren't. So, we moved to my parents' home state for peace of mind. And after three months, we went back, only to find Port-au-Prince nowhere near restoration. With the desire to provide my sister and I with a better life, my parents decided for my mother to move to the United States with us. My father stayed back in Haiti to support us throughout the time that my mother was unemployed. We lived in Randolph, Massachusetts, and I attended Martin E. Young Elementary School. I managed to double task learning English and doing regular schoolwork. A year later, I attended Randolph Community Middle School. And by that second school year, I was already a level four English as a second language student, meaning I did not need more than two classes of English, English learners. And by the eighth grade, I was completely removed from the ESL program. Also in the eighth grade, I was a part of student council and a part of National Junior Honor Society. That summer, I had to choose which high school I wanted to go to, and my options were Blue Hills Regional and Randolph High School. I chose Blue Hills Regional because they are a career and technical education school, which would provide me with the head start and the career that I want to pursue. Sadly, that summer, my mother, sister, and I moved to Brockton, Massachusetts, and there were no possible way I could attend Blue Hills Regional. I was devastated. But whenever a door closes, a window opens up. My mother's friend suggested Southeastern Regional. The first day I came here, the building was under construction and most of the staff were on vacation. I kept calling the school and I kept coming here every two days until I finally found a guidance counselor who I was able to explain my situation to. Luckily, a couple students who I got accepted to the school moved away, and that opened up a spot for me. I was very pleased and satisfied with the idea of a new start at a new school. After going through the exploratory process, I chose medical assisting as my first choice because of the skills I would learn and also for the four years of experience that I would receive. Need I say that I got my first choice? Being enrolled in that program exposed me to real life situations at class and at clinical. I am able to combine science, technology, and math along with my shop. Such examples range from learning vital signs to anatomy and physiology. I have also earned my certifications in OSHA and CPR, and I am learning to become an EKG technician through the same program. Through my first-hand experience, I came to the conclusion 
that after graduation, I want to attend the Direct Entry Physician Assistant Program at Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, or Springfield. And after those six years are over, I would like to continue school and gain my PhD. Southeastern Regional does not just provide technical shops and academics, but also many opportunities for students to grow as individuals and become well-rounded through extracurricular activities. I became an athlete, a varsity cheerleader, and a varsity lacrosse player. I got the opportunity to get involved in several leadership activities within the school. This year, I proudly serve as the class president. I am a member of this chapter's National Honor Society. But most importantly, I got involved with SkillsUSA Massachusetts. SkillsUSA's mission is to provide opportunities for its members to become world-class workers, leaders, and responsible American citizens while improving America's workforce. I was honored to serve as this year's Region 2 Vice President of SkillsUSA Massachusetts. And through that, I participated in many leadership activities, such as traveling to Kentucky to serve as a voting delegate at the National Conference, earning my Leader Award, traveling and visiting Washington, D.C., attending a leadership training institute where I was able to earn my statement award and meet with Senator Warren, serving as the, members, as the members representative at our fall state annual skills leadership and conference, participating in numerous community service projects with my favorite being putting together a holiday party for children in need, serving the members at our annual district competitions, providing a booth for personal protective equipments for girls in non-traditional trades, representing SkillsUSA Massachusetts at the State House, once again serving the members at our annual State Leadership and Skills Conference in April. I was able to earn silver for the Presidential Service Award, which came with an honorable letter signed by President Barack Obama. I have grown so much this year through Skills USA, and I am happy to inform you that I was elected to serve the members once again. Between these walls of Southeastern Regional Vocational Technical High School, all students are treated equally and with respect, regardless of our diverse background, affording us the opportunity to become greater than we ever thought possible. My CTE experience can be best captured by the following. Nous te bay courage nou pou gratis. C'est pour nous prendre liberté nou, pou tête nou, a pou tout nou. We have dared to be free. Let us dare to be so by ourselves and for ourselves. Jean-Jacques Dessalines. Thank you for allowing me to speak and share my story with you guys today. It's been an honor. Sure, you have the emotional guy get up next. <laughs> Those of you that know me know I get emotional. <laughs> Barry Bluestone is a professor of political economy in the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University. He served as the founding director of the Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy from 1999 to 2015 and the founding dean of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs from 2000 to 2012. Before assuming these posts, Bluestone spent 12 years at the University of Massachusetts at Boston as a professor of political economy. He taught economics at Boston College for 15 years and was a director of the university's Social Welfare Research Institute. Professor Bluestone was raised in Detroit and attended the University of Michigan, where he received his BA, MA, and finally his PhD in economics. At the Dukakis Center, Bluestone has led research projects on housing, local economic development, state and local public finance in the manufacturing sector in Massachusetts. As a political economist, he contributes regularly to the academic as well as popular journals 
and is the author of 11 books. As part of his work, Dr. Bluestone spends a considerable amount of time consulting with trade unions, in industry groups, and various federal and state government agencies. He was executive advisor to the Governor's Commission on the Future of Mature Indus Industries in Massachusetts and has worked with the Economic Development Departments of various states. He has testified before congressional committees and lectures regularly before the university, before university, labor, community, and business groups. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. Barry Bluestone. lots of speeches a year, but um, I've never had to follow uh, someone like Arlette, and um, I'm completely kerfuffled because of that. Um, as Lou said, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. My wife is also here. We both went to Mumford High School, made fam famous by Eddie Murphy in Be uh, uh, Beverly Hills Cop. Uh, and it was interesting, because both my parents were very fortunate to grow up in New York City, where they could go to free college. My father did it. Uh, City College of New York, my mother, the hunter, and therefore it was fairly likely that I was going to go to college as well when I attended high school. Uh, nonetheless, at Mumford High School, a wonderful inner city comprehensive high school, where I had two years of Latin, I had physics, chemistry, and biology, <coughs> I had English and history and social studies, I also had the great opportunity to have two years of industrial drawing, a semester of mechanical shop, a semester of wood shop, and in my senior year, I had a semester of print shop where at the age of 17, I printed my own business cards. As such, I have been a great fan of vocational education uh, because I think it is so critical, not just for the kids who come here to Southeastern Regional, but for kids across the Commonwealth in whatever endeavor they go into. We were very fortunate a few years ago, Jack McCarthy is here from the Mass School Building Authority, and Jack came to us with his staff and asked us at the Dukakis Center if we would do a study of what the likely occupational outlook would be in Massachusetts by the year uh, 2022. And we took a look at those data, working with uh, our staff, including Alan Clayton Matthews, former member of the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, to Deval Patrick and Tim uh, Murray's administration, uh, and also president of the New England Economic Partnership. And we came up with some rather staggering numbers as to what Massachusetts would need, not only to fill new jobs, but to fill many, many jobs that would come open as older folks like, uh, like me retired. So the first of two studies that I want to talk about very, very briefly to keep us on time is this study we did um, in, uh, two years ago looking at uh, major occupational groups probably be hard for you to see this, uh, but the important thing is, is we asked the question between 2012, which was our base year, and 2022, how many new jobs would be created, entirely new jobs? And the answer is over 380,000 new jobs. Okay? And they were in all kinds of fields, uh, food preparation, manufacturing, uh, in the service economy, professional jobs, technical jobs. Uh, but 381,000, we thought, well, that's a huge number. But then we also took a look at the need for replacement workers. Many of you in this room are going to begin to think about retirement. Uh, over the next 15 years, we're going to have huge retirements. And the result is, is that we have about 380,000 brand new jobs. We're going to have about 780,000 job openings just to replace people who are retiring. So somehow, in order to maintain the prosperity of Massachusetts, between now and 2022, which is just around the corner, we have to find people to fill 1.1 million job openings. Okay. Um, we also know, and I've been teaching in universities since 1971, that we are going to need people who have all kinds of educational background. In fact, um, if we look at the occupational distribution in 2022 and ask, well, what kind of jobs are we going to need? What kind of high school, what kind of background? Still, we're going to have about a third of our jobs, 
some food service jobs, some personal service jobs that require high school. We're going to have another 30% that requires some college or an associate degree, and about 37% uh, that require a four-year college degree or something like that. That's very different than we often think about. You know, we hear every person must complete a four-year education or there are no good jobs for them. That's just not true. In fact, uh, I love the wonderful story that I've heard. Many of you have probably heard about it. Uh, there is this brilliant uh, brain surgeon at uh, Mass General Hospital who a couple years ago found he had a leak under his sink. And he called his plumber. And the plumber came and in about 12 minutes fixed the sink and gave him a bill for $150. And the brain surgeon said, you know, that's more than I make doing brain surgery. To which the plumber says, well, it was more than I made when I was a brain surgeon. <laughs> We're going to need plumbers, electricians. We're going to need people who can run our restaurants. We're going to need people who can run our hospitals and make our medical care system. This is what we found. Second of all, working with the Alliance for Vocational Technical Education, we were asked if we would conduct a series of surveys. And we surveyed thousands of people. One of the surveys we did was an employer survey. We asked employers, essentially, uh, where do you get your employer, employees? What's the role of technical education? And this is what we found. 69% of the firms, and this is a random sample of all firms in Massachusetts, 69% expect to increase their employment base over the next five years. Great news for all of us. Question is, where are you going to find these employees for those 69% who expect to increase employment? Second of all, what we found out is that these employers have a very strong preference for vocational school graduates. 75% of the employers, again, a random sample of employers, right, <coughs> told us that they actually have a preference for vocational school graduates for entry-level positions. And more than three-fifths of these employers said they actually had a preference for vocational uh, technical school graduates for a higher level of so our employers know that what's done here in Southeastern Regional and in our 26 regional schools and in our comprehensive schools offering uh, technical education, this is critical to their operations. More than two-thirds of employers have a favorable view of vocational education. And 56% of employers see the need for vocational technical education grads to meet their job needs. I think it was partly because of that employer group, Tim Murray and the Worcester Chamber were critical in this, uh, that the governor, uh, Baker, and the legislature increased spending on vocational education, recognizing how important this would be to the future, not only of the kids who get the education like Arlette has got, but because of what employers need. Our key findings, our employers surveyed overwhelmingly prefer VTE grads, uh, more than 90% of employers see a need to increase the number of vocational high school graduates to meet their own needs. Nine out of ten employers in Massachusetts see that. Second of all, we did a survey of vocational, current vocational school students. In fact, we interviewed, we surveyed more than 3,000 of them. And we asked them, what do you think about your school? And this was done outside of school in most cases, so uh, we don't think it was biased. 65% of the students are white, 30% are Hispanic, 10% are black. Very well representative of the overall demographics of our young people in Massachusetts. <coughs> the top majors were visual arts, plumbing, culinary arts, carpentry, and HVAC. <coughs> the top industries that they will likely go into are professional and technical services, construction, <coughs> and health care. And nearly 94% of current VTA students believe their programs at their current school meet their expectations. I wish I could say the same of my students at Northeastern University. <laughs> <laughs> nearly 50% of VTA students expect to go on to a four-year college. Many people think that technical, many people who don't know the truth think of technical education as a terminal degree. No, most of our students go on for some additional training uh, in their own field, in a community college, or some of them are ending up as students of mine at Northeastern University at BU, and a few of them are ending up at Harvard and MIT, right? VTA students believe that their schools are preparing them 
well for the future. And our survey suggests that current vocational school students are well satisfied with their school experience. We then said, OK, let's go and survey some grads. What are they doing? We surveyed almost 400 of them. And um, we asked, well, what programs were you in when you were in school? And the uh, very high ones were professional, uh, scientific and technical services, uh, health care, accommodation and food services, and construction. But it was across the board, but those were the top ones. Uh, we asked them, did you have good job prospects when you graduated? 56% strongly agree. That includes period four. Students should now move on to their period five classes. Yes. <laughs> there he goes to period five. 30% agree. So, um, you know, over almost 90% agree that their training really gave them the job prospects they had hoped for. Um, we asked them, did you have your first choice of program? Here are a little bit mixed results. 64% strongly agreed that they could get into the, the program they wanted to. 28% uh, disagreed. And the problem is, is that until recently, we've had limitations on openings in many of the programs that students want. We hope we're going to be able, through the alliance, through the legislature, through the governor, add to these programs so students can more often get their first choice. How much has your vocational program met your expectations? 90% um, plus said agreed or strongly agreed. Uh, so again, we found among graduates of VTA programs strong in and then we talked to some administrators. Uh, and um, we found out that uh, they had oversubscribed programs, uh, particularly in electrical technology, health careers, culinary arts, and so forth. Here is where we're not meeting students' needs. We um, talked about what were the major obstacles to uh, expansion of the programs. Funding for equipment, which I think Jack is going to give some help on. Jack's right here. Standing right there. Smile, Jack. I don't want these people to know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> Funding for buildings. Jack helps with that as well. And his fine staff. Funding for personnel and staff. Uh, in brief, our VTU schools are pressed beyond their limits to provide all interest students with admission to their schools and would probably uh, discover even greater demand if they were present. And we have many long waiting lists at many of our schools. We then also ask parents. What do you think? Um, overwhelmingly, they thought that their schools where their kids were going were providing their students with good skills, good foundation for further training. More than 95% of parents have a favorable or very favorable opinion of the schools where their kids go to school. Uh, so parents, employers, the students themselves, the graduates all see what we're doing here in the state through our vocational programs to be top notch. And finally, we did just a broad community survey. These are people at large. They don't have kids in the vocational schools. They didn't necessarily attend vocational school themselves. And this is where we found something really surprising. Because when I was growing up, voc ed had a kind of stigma attached to it. You know, voc ed is where the kids who can't go to college go. That stigma <coughs> is changing rapidly. That is disappearing. Over 90% of the public feel that vocational schools are doing a great job, good job, and an important job in the Commonwealth. More than two-thirds of, uh, of the public, these are adults, would consider a vocational school for their own children. Wow. And therefore, our overall summary was, we've got a great system. It's serving the Commonwealth in terms of our students. It's serving the Commonwealth in terms of our employers. <coughs> It's serving the Commonwealth in terms of our future prosperity, but we need to continue to invest and invest more resources to make sure that not only do we have students able to select the field they want to go into, but that we can have every child who can qualify for a vocational school as a spot here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. And um, we're actually gonna, gonna, gonna talk about two, two uh, exciting programs that are designed to expand access. I am, 
I am um, personally convinced that the key to expanding access is uh, through quality partnerships uh, and working together uh, with member schools and member agencies, uh, not through competition. And I'm, and I'm excited again to talk about two of them uh, quickly here this morning um, that will expand the vocational opportunities to our students. Nearly 50 years ago when Southeastern Regional was formed, we actually had two uh, and, and still have two core missions. One, uh, as many people know, is to provide quality vocational education to high schools, but the other is to provide quality post-secondary education. And, and we have a quite large uh, post-secondary uh, institute called STI. Dave Deegan is here who, who kind of supports that. You see some of the programs, certificate programs we offer, which mirror very closely to, to where the need is. And, and as, a, as a kind of an aside, we use your data and your study to help uh, inform our decision. So I want to thank you very much for that important analysis. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kathy Smith, Superintendent of Brockton, who is working collaboratively, collaboratively with Southeastern to increase access to vocational opportunities through a dual enrollment partnership agreement. Dr. Smith is a long-standing administrator for the Brockton Public School System, and when you talk to her, you immediately know that her focus is on kids. She's passionate about education and kids, and we are lucky to have such a great cooperative relationship with the same goal of giving students from Brockton the best possible education. Kathy? Good morning. It really is a pleasure to be here today. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, Mayor Carpenter, all our special guests, uh, Representative Cronin, all our elected officials. I think the one thing that's very clear today is it truly does take a partnership. For every Arlette that you see here, we have many of these students in our schools. They're wonderful students. They've persevered. Their families have come here. They've learned English as a second language. They are very, very successful. And the one thing that is the common thread is they need our support, the support of superintendents coming together, sharing grants, having vision, and make sure that every child is all our children. So I want to thank you, uh, Superintendent Lopes, for always, again, being a wonderful partner. I want to thank the people here that each and every day, and we know how difficult it has been to support education, but when you look at students like Arlette and know there are thousands more, we just graduated a thousand, a thousand kids two weeks ago, and to make sure that they continue to have every opportunity, and unfortunately, and Superintendent Lopes and I have talked about this, there are many students from Brockton that would like a, a vocational education. We try at our school, and Jack McCarthy, we are looking to build that STEM wing, and I know the mayor and I are going to be having these very serious conversations about where we go. But every student is not able to be accepted here. And to have these kind of partnerships, and we're talking about a dual enrollment, where our students come out with a certificate, with able to be employed, continue to go on to college, all those wonderful things. You know, I thank you for this opportunity and for years to come for all the visions that you have for our students. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And our hope is to try to uh, pilot this program in the fall. Uh, and as Kathy mentioned, the students will graduate with a Brockton High School diploma from a wonderful, wonderful school, and also through a dual partnership attend our technical institute, which, which starts at 4.30 uh, in, some, in several programs, and they'll graduate a week later with a post-secondary certificate uh, at no cost. The only cost is the cost that actually goes to their, to their licensing, their trade certifications, their tools, equipment, and uniforms. So we're, we're looking for some grant opportunities to help with that because even, even at just $2,000, that's a lot for some students from Brockton and so forth. And, and uh, we spoke earlier with, I, with the mayor, and, and, and our hope is that this is, this is a uh, successful program that can be replicated um, throughout not just other communities uh, in Southeastern, but, uh, but throughout other communities in the Commonwealth. Uh, briefly, I wanna, I'm going to uh, introduce, um, I'm going to last year here, um, the, the, next, the next partnership, um, which is, uh, um, we mentioned how, how we ha schools have waiting lists and so forth, and, and one of the things we're trying to do is to try to come up with these inter-district agreements where when there are openings in other schools, we can somehow partner, and again, at no cost, uh, and no, no assessment increase and so forth. So for the next announcements, I'm gonna call, next, I'd like to call up Dr. Alex Magalhaes, Superintendent of Bristol Plymouth, who's gonna talk about a grant application that we just applied for. Well, that's a great segue, thank you. Um, 
in order to, we're, we're talking a lot about students, the, the, uh, the 9 through 12 students, but we're also going to look at students that graduated yesterday, for the 1,000 students, and some that don't have employment. So one of the partnerships that um, we're talking about is that our schools really, and, and, and I've been in forums like this, and, and I try to put a shout out that our schools get underutilized in the evening after 2.30. In your case, it's probably after 4, right? Um, but after 2.30, it's kind of, we have some programs, but it's, it's underutilized. It's, and we have great facilities for training, for high-skilled jobs. So <clears throat> I, I am proud to say that um, Tri-County, Southeastern, and Bristol Plymouth has uh, proposed to enter an uh, inter-district agreement where students from the 27 towns and cities serve the three districts get, um, that can take Chapter 74 uh, and non-Chapter 7 post, uh, post-secondary programs at in-district costs, so saving money. And what this allows us to do is build capacity. Um, so students will uh, automatically have open seats. If they don't have open seats in our, our school, they can go to Southeast and they can go to Tri-County. So it's a partnership. It could be that we have a full um, capacity in one of our Chapter 74 programs. Uh, maybe Mr. Doherty uh, doesn't have one and we can send students there. And there's also an opportunity where we don't have the same programs that Southeastern uh, offers. And we may have students that may want those kind of programs. So again, uh, it's a partnership where they can move into and instead of waiting. We can share resources uh, as far as the three communities. Uh, the whole paperwork that goes along with uh, putting Chapter 74 programs and, and enrollment. But most importantly is, is the job placement. We have co-op coordinators that work for us uh, in our district. These can also be used to collaborate, to uh, partner with our industry partners and find employment when they get their certifications, our, our adult programs. And, and finding them jobs. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're also looking to expand uh, our, our Chapter 74 programs. And we're looking at the electrical program. Uh, again, you know, Dr. Bloomberg, you mentioned how electrical was over, overprescribed. You're right, uh, subscribed rather. And um, so that's one of the programs. We have a plumbing program that's very robust in our school that are, are, you know, we have waiting uh, lists for that on, and at the Chapter 74 level. So we're looking at opening up Chapter 74 programs at the post-secondary level. We heard the manufacturing. Again, these are programs that we can utilize our buildings to retrain the students that just recently graduated or under the unemployed and get the, the, those people moving. Our primary target population will be students placed in waiting lists from uh, communities served by the three regional districts, including the Gateway Cities, the Brockton, and Taunton in the towns of Berkeley, Bridgewater, Dighton, Easton, East Bridgewater, Foxborough, Franklin, Mansfield, Medfield, Medway, Middleborough, Millis, Norfolk, North Attleboro, Norton, Plainville, Rainham, Rehoboth, Seekonk, Sharon, Sherborne, Stoughton, Walpole, West Bridgewater, and Rentham. That's our primary target is uh, you know, the waiting list. But we also have a secondary target. What about those students that never thought of coming to vocational schools because they, you know, there's, I don't have the data with me and, I, and, and there's a, a data out there that shows that students tend to follow their friends to their traditional high schools. How about now that they graduated, where are they going? Uh, that could be, again, another partnership with our sending schools and finding ways to, fi you know, bring them into those post-secondary education programs. So those are the kind of, you know, folks we're looking for. You know, uh, we want to tackle the, uh, the waiting list. We want to tackle the unemployed, and we also want to tackle the recent graduates that are not at this time, um, you know, not sure where they're going. So uh, and I'm looking forward to this partnership. It is a proposal that's out there, and, um, and hopefully we can uh, work together and make this happen. Thank you. Excuse me now, it's just easy enough. These are, these are two, uh, two great partnerships and just a couple of examples of what's possible when organizations uh, come together with a common goal and put, put kids in economic development above competition. 
Um, please take a look at the handouts, which include other partnerships from Upper Cape, South Shore. Um, to close, I invite uh, MAB Executive Director Dave Ferreira uh, to the podium to discuss the next steps. But before I do, I, I will offer one last thought. Several years ago, MAVA came together with key individuals to offer statewide articulation agreements with registered apprenticeship programs and community colleges. And Dave Ferrer was instrumental in making that happen. I believe the time has come to move from statewide articulation agreements to statewide dual enrollment agreements. There's no reason why students who score proficient in advance at the conclusion of their sophomore year could not be dual enrolled in quality community colleges during the junior senior year. Taking college courses in place of high school academic coursework and graduate from high school with a quality vocational education, a high school diploma combined with an associate's degree from a community college. The people that can make that happen are sitting in this room today. I offer to work with anyone who shares my vision. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Lou. I know we're running a little over, but uh, I beg your indulgence. I'm gonna give up some of my time uh, so that Heather, uh, one of the other students, has an opportunity to say a, a few words about her experiences, because they speak much more eloquently than I do. Heather? Hey, close. Um, hi, everyone. Yes, yeah, so uh, my name is Taylor Mackey, and I graduated here last year. Um, I'm from Mansfield, and I graduated here, and I took the Design and Visual Communications program. Uh, I now attend Winthrop University in South Carolina, where I double major in musical theater and visual communications. Um, and I am proud to say that in three years, when I graduate from this university, I will be leaving with little to no debt. And I can also say with confidence that that is because I got a career in technical education. CTE schools provide opportunities. And finally, after many years, which we even looked at the stats for today, America is becoming aware of this. Um, a month ago, Samantha Dorwin from McCann Technical High School was named the 2016 U.S. Presidential Scholar, being the first career and technical student to ever receive this very prestigious award. She serves as one of many, many individuals who are proving that this type of an education has come such a long way. Career and technical high schools are for both students who want to go into the workforce and for students who want to go to college. And there's no right answer because we are prepared for both of those things. When I first decided that I wanted to apply to Southeastern Regional Vocational Technical High School, I was greeted with some disapproval from my father. Um, I was told, like many individuals at the time, that vocational schools were for kids who didn't want to go to college. Um, and of course, I had to believe him. I mean, he was my dad. He had a professional degree, and he knew what he was talking about, so I believed him. And as a young, rebellious middle schooler, I, of course, applied anyway. Um, and only come to find that those individuals and my dad couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, leaving middle school with a straight C report card and just coming off my ADHD medication for the first time since I was eight years old, I was really looking to Southeastern to guide me. Um, there were three key things that a career in technical education did for me. The first thing it did was teach me professionalism and leadership. And as a young girl with ripped black jeans, thick black eyeliner, and had no idea how to use an iron, these things were very helpful for me. Uh, I honed these assets through four years of participation in a national career and technical organization known as Skills USA. Um, an organization that allowed me to travel this country meeting business professionals, CEOs, and on one occasion meet Tim McGraw and advocate for CTE, as well as work on Congressman Joe Kennedy's Youth Council. Four years of vigorous leadership and professionalism training and life-changing opportunities that motivated me. And this was an organization that without the support and several, several pushes from Southeastern, I would not have been a part of. And these are the skills that helped me talk to the representative of my college before I had even applied to them. Now, attending a college in a new state, in a new environment, is just another milestone that SkillsUSA and career in technical education have prepared me for. 
and I'm able to survive because of key factor number two. Career and technical education gave me a skill. It gave me a trade that I am able to be proud of. At my university, this is one of the things that sets me apart. I received four years of specialized digital design training here at Southeastern Training that allowed me to be hired as the university's headshot photographer and photoshopper as a freshman. Next year, I will be teaching three Adobe programs classes as a sophomore. And who doesn't love to get paid to go to school? <laughs> These are programs that I learned here at Southeastern. And I'm able to balance 21 credit hours with a 3.8 GPA, be in three plays and work two jobs because that is what CTE prepared me for. We learn everything a public high school learns and we learn a real life skill that puts us ahead. We learn to balance both and we learn to face those who tell us that we can't because that's key factor number three. Southeastern, SkillsUSA, and CTE gave me a voice. Before coming here, I was told that I wouldn't succeed because I didn't care about my education and I didn't care about pushing myself forward. But CTE showed me that with each and every speaking opportunity that I was given, that I do have a voice and that everyone does if they are given that opportunity. And CTE provides it. These are the values of a career in technical education. And these are only three of the things that have directly influenced me. Arlette, there are hundreds, hundreds of people who are influenced by career and technical educations. For a lot of people, including me, it was their first real shot at finding something they loved and being really, really good at it. As business partners and government officials supporting career and technical education, let me be the first to tell you that you are helping change lives. And it has changed mine. Thank you very much. I already apologized to, to Taylor. Um, I'm glad I gave my time up because she, again, as did Alette, the epitomized what we're all about and what career technical education can do for each and every child. Um, I'd like to, a couple of shout outs for thank yous, particularly to Lou Lopes, Debbie Cabral, and the staff here at Southeastern. Um, we let them know we were looking for a place to host the AVT regional event. What he didn't know was that when we, you host, you take responsibility for all of it. So he was here with his jeans last night. I, apparently, I was told, setting this all up. He did a great job, as he does for graduation as well. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs> and the staff and Debbie. Uh, our DESC representatives that are here, Ramona Foster, uh, Maureen, uh, Mara Russell, I saw Keith Westridge, and I'm sure I shouldn't have said the names because I'm gonna forget, Gary Gomes, thank you, uh, are here uh, coming from Malden and from Boston to be with us and we thank them for their support and partnership um, that as well. I got some good news and some bad news. We just found out late yesterday afternoon, uh, Tim Murray made reference to the $75 million capital fund that's part of the governor's economic development. Uh, the committee, the Joint Committee on Economic Development uh, forwarded it out with a cut in that money from $75 million to $45 million. That's the bad news. The good news, uh, I guess you could say, is the $75 million was over a five-year period the 45 million is over a three year period. So if you do the arithmetic quick, we still got the same $15 million for both years. So uh, we, uh, yesterday, Representative Antonio Cabral's office, I contacted him. Uh, he's from New Bedford. Uh, and the reason we contacted him is he chairs the, the Joint Committee on Bonding, which is where this bonding bill next goes. If you have an opportunity to reach out to your uh, representative and legislator to let the bonding committee know that we're fully behind it, we will be sending something from MAVA to, in support of that bill. I was also told uh, that there's a hearing tomorrow at uh, tomorrow, Tuesday at 11 a.m., uh, but that's rather short notice for most of us, so you can do something by email uh, to the Joint Committee, or you can do it by picking up the phone and calling uh, Representative Cabral's office directly, or one of your representatives as well. 
So thank you in advance for any help you can give. That should report out within a week. Uh, where it goes from there, I'd have to speak to the professional legislators who know a lot more about this than I do, but uh, once we find out, we'll let you know where it's headed next. But the deadline is July 31st if the economic development bill is going to be passed in this legislative session. And uh, so that's one ask. My second ask and, and final ask actually is, is what Lou Lopes has talked about and others, relationships and maximizing current assets. Relationships. We have to communicate better as between the Brockton superintendent and the Southeastern superintendent and our focus needs to be on the young men and women in the middle schools and also, as Lou said, those that are in high school that are kind of wandering and just finishing up and don't really leave high school with a goal or don't have anything uh, that motivates them. And we heard a lot about motivation from our students today. So we've got to work on relationships and these facilities, Southeastern, Bristol Plymouth, uh, Old Colony, uh, I shouldn't have started because the list is here, Blue Hills, uh, are all great schools that need to be used all day long, into the afternoons, into the evenings with adult learners, working directly with business and industry to retrain and upgrade skills of existing uh, workers. Uh, so I ask you uh, to give those thoughts, keep them in mind. I really appreciate all Lou has done the co-sponsors, everyone who came today, all of you here, uh, that you take this message and carry it forward to your friends and colleagues so that uh, we can move the ball forward. The AVTE, the partnership, the alliance uh, can do more for more kids across the Commonwealth. And I'll close by saying Lou will have the opportunity for those who would like to do a brief school tour and can fit that into their busy schedule. For those to which it applies, happy Father's Day. And to those that it doesn't, have a great weekend. Thank you very much.